Welcome everyone to FAWR's Spring Grant Program Update. We are thrilled to have you joining us today. I'm Susan Hedstrom. I'm the Executive Director for FPWR and mom to Jaden, who's now 12 years old with PWS. I'm going to be your moderator today. On today's webinar, Dr. Strong, FPWR's Director of Research Programs, will provide a brief update on ongoing PWS research activities, as well as share our five newly funded research grants. As always, we would love to answer any questions you may have, so please feel free to write them into the Q&A, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I hand you over to Dr. Strong. Thanks so much, Susan, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to tell you about the latest research that's going on in PWS and share some of the new research projects. And it's exciting to do this in uh, the PWS Awareness Month. And, and this is the reason that I do the work that I do is uh, Daniel, my 27-year-old uh, son, <coughs> excuse me, with PWS. I can't believe it's 27, but there you go. Um, so what we'll do today is talk about some of the ongoing research activities, um, some of the things that have come out of previous uh, grant funding, and then talk about some of the new grants that are going to be funded this year. And these are grants that were submitted last fall. And as Susan said, we're happy to have, uh, hopefully we'll leave plenty of time for discussion and questions, happy to have your input and uh, questions. Um, and as a reminder, FPWR's mission is to eliminate the challenges of PWS through the advancement of research and uh, therapeutic development. So everything we do is really aimed at advancing research so that we can get new treatments for our kids with PWS, kids and young adults. So we have a lot of things going on, uh, some really exciting things. Uh, one is the uh, PWS Genome Project, uh, which was recently launched. We're really excited. We've talked about this for a little while um, and we've now got it up and rolling. And this is a project that is looking to understand how DNA variants outside of the PWS region might influence the severity of PWS, the symptoms that our kids experience, how well they do on some drugs, and whether they, you know, they might be at higher risk for side effects from other drugs. So we're at the very early stages of this project. This is something that we view as uh, something that we will be built upon for several years. Um, but uh, we are recruiting uh, 50 individuals to get started and we'll do whole genome sequencing, which will allow us to look at all the DNA variants across all of the chromosomes. And then we'll look at features such as seizures. For, so for example, we know that less than 20% of individuals with PWS experience seizures, but obviously if you experience seizures, it's a really important symptom. And so there are known DNA variants that in, impact the risk of seizures and are those at play in our kids with PWS. So our ultimate goal here is to have a more personalized understanding of the severity of the symptoms that an individual with PWS uh, will experience. And that's a long way off, um, but we're just kind of building the, the knowledge towards that. And importantly, the DNA um, sequence data is going to be coupled with the characteristics of that individual as reported in the global PWS registry. So look for this project to um, uh, look for progress on it over the, the and years. If you want more information, you can uh, contact us at this email uh, here, pwsgenome at fpwr.org. We also are really fortunate to have so many clinical trials uh, going on in the PWS space, and um, some of them are shown here. Um, and these are uh, clinical trials, so they're, they're in uh, individuals with PWS, or in some cases, these earlier trials are currently in healthy volunteers, but uh, will move to individuals with PWS. Um, most recently, there's been uh, two large, well, actually three large phase three clinical trials that have been completed, uh, one by Melendo, which did not show efficacy. Um, and so uh, that company has left the space. 
Um, but two others, Carbitocin and DCCR, did show some promise in PWS. And those companies, as many of you are aware, right, are, are talking with the FDA right now about what are the appropriate next steps. And uh, we've been doing some advocating um, that many of you have participated in. And uh, we look forward to uh, doing what we can as a patient community to, to uh, help the FDA understand the medical needs in our community. But I guess the big, big picture point is that there are many new uh, um, drugs coming up that are either about to enter clinical trials like Sanionis Tezimet or have started clinical trials in PWS like Harmony Biosciences Pitolicent. Um, and so there'll be lots of opportunity for us to uh, think about participating in clinical trials. And of course, for any of these drugs to you know, reach our families eventually, they have to be tested in individuals with PWS. So it's kind of up to us to um, you know, see that these products uh, move forward. And you know, be because entering a clinical trial obviously is an important decision that you wanna consider and talk with your own doctor about. We've tried to provide information on the uh, FPWR website, on the clinical trial site about each of these clinical trials. Um, and that's a starting point to understand, you know, is your loved one with PWS eligible for these trials? What's known about the drug? Is it, does it look like a good match? So I would encourage you to go to this website and uh, learn more about these clinical trials. I've already men mentioned Patolicin, but there are other trials if, um, if you're not interested in trying an investigational drug, for example, uh, Dr. Deepan Singh is looking at uh, guamfacine, which is uh, a, a prescribed medication for ADHD, and he's looking at whether it impacts aggression or reduces aggression in PWS. Um, and uh, there are, uh, Radius Health will be starting a study in uh, using CBD in P PWS, and Eric Hollander has a, a, a trial ongoing uh, in New York with a variant of CBD, a CBDV. So there's lots of opportunities for um, um, drug trials. There's also opportunities for non-drug interventions. Um, the group at Case Western has a study for school-age children um, looking at social skills, um, and that is completely remote. That's the other thing that has changed over the last year. Many of these clinical trials um, you know, had to be suspended because of COVID. And as they've come back, one of the silver linings is um, everyone's gotten a lot more comfortable with doing things remotely. So many of these clinical trials have changed to where there's uh, many fewer actual visits in the clinic and a lot more data being collected remotely. So if you haven't um, looked at that page in a little while, please go there and um, look at that and, and check back um, because we add, Susan adds new sites as they become available for different clinical trials. And you can sign up to get a clinical trial alert. And you, there's lots of resources to understand clinical trials and what questions should I ask before I enter a clinical trial on that page. Um, another activity that has really, uh, you know, been um, very busy in the community over the past couple of months is advocating for new treatments with the FDA. So uh, dialoguing with the FDA about the needs of the community, about the, um, the, uh, the desire of the community to try some of these new medications, the, uh, the um, tolerance of the community for accepting some risk of uncertainty about the benefit of these uh, new medications. So we have been working with the prader willi Syndrome Association um, for quite some time actually, for uh, uh, at least seven years, going together to the FDA to express the, um, the views of the community about the needs for new medications. Um, we recently, I guess last month, did a webinar uh, talking about the process, talking about the point from which uh, a company completes a clinical trial to um, uh, submitting an application for a new drug and how the patient community can be effective in advocating uh, at points along the way. So we have a a new web page that talks about that, that um, talks about some of the activities that uh, FPWR along with PWSA have done over the past years. 
Um, there's a copy of the petition that we uh, forwarded. Many of you commented. Thank you so much for commenting uh, um, on uh, the um, uh, potential benefits of DCCR, and we collated all that and sent it uh, to the FDA. We're also advocating for uh, Levo's uh, a therapy as well, again, expressing to the FDA the need for new treatments for PWS. Um, so we'll continue to work very vigorously in that respect. We have continuing uh, dialogue with the FDA and we will you know, keep you informed about uh, that progress. Um, as, as many of you know, um, COVID has impacted uh, everybody. And uh, many of you participated in the COVID survey that was in the Global PWS Registry. We also shared that information with the FDA. And I think that's very important for them to understand uh, the impact on clinical trials. Um, so I would just thank everybody and remind you that as you participate in these surveys and things through the Global Registry, it is really a way of advocating for new treatments for PWS. Um, and the Global PWS Registry is doing uh, many other things. Uh, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I would uh, encourage you to uh, visit the website and consider joining. It is one of the most important ways that we can gather information, both about the natural history of PWS, which is really important. Um, as these drugs hopefully get approved, uh, you know, we'll be able to compare how people are doing on the drugs to uh, how people who don't, you know, have, have, have historically not had access to the drugs are doing. Um, there's also a lot of activity going on with different clinicians across the PWS community looking at that um, global registry data. Um, and so if you can update your surveys, uh, that is extremely helpful. Um, and it does allow you to keep a running record of your child's medical history and stay up to date on um, research opportunities and clinical trial opportunities. So the focus today, um, so FPWR has uh, developed resources all across. This is the um, drug discovery and development pathway. And we've developed resources to try to help uh, support research at every stage along this pathway. Um, but today we're gonna focus on the grant program. And the purpose of the grant program is to support innovative research at any point along this pathway. Um, so this is our investigator initiated grant program, which means that scientists, clinicians who have ideas about what would be important to do next in PWS, submit their ideas and through a peer reviewed process, um, we select those uh, projects that are important to our families and scientifically sound. Um, so our grant program has been ongoing since the inception of PWS, of FPWR rather, and um, so far we've invested more than $15 million in PWS research, which is a lot of funds, but that funds has also led to additional investments from other uh, granting uh, programs, so it's, it's, uh, it's been leveraged to bring more funding into the space. Um, we fund internationally, so whatever projects uh, look like they're going to be important to understand and advance treatments for PWS. And the way, one of the ways that we measure um, how well our, our funds are being spent is uh, what is coming out in the medical literature, what papers are being published, and how that information is being used to build and advance, uh, advance research. Um, also through this program, we support the development of new resources, so cell models and animal models that can be used by the investigator that we support, but also by others in the field. That's one way we, that we can make a relatively small investment, but it really helps the entire field. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, some of the recent advances coming out of our previous investments. So as I said, you know, really everything we do is focused on developing uh, new interventions, new therapies for individuals with PWS, both drug interventions and non-drug interventions like social skills. Um, and this is just a list of um, some of the uh, those therapies that uh, FPWR has supported through the grant program over the last five years. Um, so this includes 
you know, drugs that are being tested in humans, including um, the first clinical trial of uh, DCCR, Salinos drug in PWS was supported by this program. Um, that was back before um, Salino, uh, it was back when it was a company called Essentialis. Um, and, and we are currently testing some other compounds, again, the guamfacine, the ADHD drug by Dr. Singh, um, uh, social interventions by a number of uh, uh, researchers, CBDV by Dr. Hollander. Those are all uh, ongoing right now. In addition, we've done a lot of testing in uh, animal models, and that's really important. Uh, frequently before you can test in humans, you have to show that a drug is safe and effective in an animal model. So it's a critical step towards moving new therapies into the clinic. And this program also supports um, those studies and some, uh, some of the preclinical molecules that have been supported through this program are shown here. So we've also seen over the last couple of months, this is just some of the papers that have come out over the last couple of months, both on the basic science of PWS, as well as clinical trials, and again, non-drug social interventions to help our kids um, learn, learn how to, uh, or more effectively interact with their peers. We also uh, published uh, through the Clinical Trials Consortium a, uh, a study on what's called caregiver burden, which is an important thing for the FDA to understand when they, they look at you know, what they call burden of disease, essentially you know, how, uh, how, how severe a disease can be for individuals. So we published a paper recently um, showing the relationship between that sort of uh, the stress on caregivers and some of the characteristics of PWS like hyperphagia and um, anxiety behaviors. And, you know, not surprisingly to any of us, um, you know, we found that when hyperphagia and, and some of the behavioral problems were high, it was, it was a bigger stress on the caregiver and on the family. And, you know, again, that's not a surprise to us, but it's really important to have the hard data to take to the FDA so that they can understand. FDA is very data driven and, you know, we can go and say, oh, hyperphagia is a problem, but they want to see, you know, is it a problem for everyone in the population? You know, they, they really like to dig through the weeds of that. You know, is it correlated with people who have more stress in their lives? Because that, you know, means that if you could treat it, it might, you know, not only improve the life of the person with PWS, which is the ultimate goal, but also the entire family. Um, and another thing that's come out very recently is a, uh, a paper from uh, Dr. Uh, Gowling Ming's group at University of Pennsylvania, and they are using cell models. So, so a few years ago, um, we started making some investments in stem cell research for PWS as a way to better understand PWS. And it's really nice to now see the fruition of some of those investments, and this is one of them. So, this group is um, recapitulating uh, sort of a mini brain in a dish. And um, they've been able to develop a technique to take stem cells and, and kind of turn them into a part of the hypothalamus in a dish. So the arcuate uh, nucleus is the particular part of the hypothalamus that's kind of critical to hunger and satiety. So it has all of the neurons that regulate those hunger and satiety properties. So these investigators uh, figured out how to take the stem cells and grow them over the course of 70 days into a little ball that represents the, um, the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And then they did that um, with FPWR funding uh, with both uh, typical neurons and then the PWS neurons. And then they asked, okay, so what's different? And they found a lot of things different actually. So uh, firstly, they found that um, there were more precursor cells in the PWS organoids, um, indicating that there may be a problem with the, so, so cells grow and then they kind of differentiate and do their business. And what they found was the PWS cells, they grew, they were slower to differentiate and kind of do their jobs. And in this case, the job is regulating that hunger and satiety. 
They also found that they had decreased responsiveness to leptin. Leptin's a hormone that tells your body that you've got plenty of fat, you don't need to eat anymore. And these organoids, even separated from a person, were not very responsive to leptin. So that's an important feature that is important to understand and consider as we develop uh, new drugs for PWS. And they showed, um, and this kind of built on the work of others, that there is increased uh, microglia or inflammatory cell infiltration um, when they grow the organoids in certain conditions. Um, and this suggests potentially a new therapeutic pathway, um, you know, that maybe there's an inflammatory component that is sort of over robust in PWS compared to typical individuals. And so this paper really builds on our growing knowledge of how the, the brain and brain function is different in PWS. And that's important for understanding what new targets for therapy might be, and also gives a potential um, uh, model in which you could test and see if particular drugs uh, kind of correct things and bring them back more towards uh, the way typical neurons behave. Um, We've also, again, we made several investments in stem cell research uh, for PWS. One of them was to Dr. Larry Ryder. Um, many of you have given your kids baby teeth to Dr. Ryder, and, and this is what he does with them, which is just beautiful. Here, here are um, uh, differentiated neuronal cell cultures from those baby teeth. Um, and one of the things that he's looking at is we know that kids with PWS seem to have a disruption in circadian rhythm. And their lab is currently looking at whether they can see that actually in the cells in a dish. Um, and so this is just showing that they, they look at genes that have a, a periodicity, so a 24 hour rhythm. And then they look at that in typical neurons and then in neurons from individuals with PWS and also individuals with Shaf-Yang syndrome. So as a reminder, Shaf-Yang syndrome is a, um, occurs when one of the PWS genes, MAGEL2 only, is, is mutated. And individuals with uh, Shaf-Yang syndrome also have very disrupted sleep. And you know, that's, a, that's a really important feature for families. Um, it's obviously, it's, it's very disruptive if your, your child is up all night and kind of sleepy during the day, we all, we all know this. Um, and so understanding that at the molecular level, I think it's really important to understand how we might go about treating that. Um, and so Dr. Ryder has been looking at that in both um, stem cells derived from teeth of individuals with PWS as well as Shaf-Yang syndrome and is, is seeing some differences in the circadian rhythms. Okay, so that's just a, you know, uh, highlights just a couple of things picked out of all the work that is going on, thanks to all of you who are supporting FPWR. And I wanted to talk now about the new projects that we are funding um, this, this spring. Again, these are projects that were submitted last fall. Um, and this is the list and I'll go through each of them briefly. Um, the first is a clinical study uh, looking at adult spine alignment from Dr. Van Boss. Um, so many of you know Dr. Van Boss. He's, uh, he's an expert in uh, orthopedics and uh, probably the world's expert on scoliosis in PWS. We know that the majority of children with PWS uh, do develop a spine curvature at some point during their life, and, and many of them go on to have scoliosis surgery. And, um, you know, as, as many families can attest to, this is a really challenging surgery. And in PWS, it's associated with a high complication or, a, you know, a higher complication rate than in typical individuals. So anything we can do to reduce the complication rate would be important. And, you know, obviously that is an important goal of Dr. Van Boss. Um, so this study is going to look at the typical spine alignment in individuals with PWS who do not have to undergo surgery, who do not have, you know, really extensive scoliosis. Um, and, and Dr. Uh, Van Boss is hoping that that will provide guidance as to how uh, those kids who need surgery, um, how they, their spines are corrected. 
So we're interested in the study because, you know, there's really not been very much work done on what is kind of the normal for PWS and whether, you know, the surgeon should be shooting for kind of normal PWS as opposed to, you know, typical individuals in that spinal surgery. So these measures of uh, spinal alignment will be uh, really important in answering some of those questions and could really impact the care of individuals with PWS who have significant um, scoliosis. So the long-term goal is to uh, reduce post-operative failures and in improve the, the comfort of it who have to undergo surgery. In the category of neurobiology, we have um, three different grants that I'll talk about. Um, the first is Dr. Gina Yostin at St. Louis University, and she is looking at um, what's called orphan uh, G-protein coupled receptors, so GPCRs. Um, these are really uh, interesting drug targets. There's been a lot of success in other fields um, targeting these kinds of molecules. And some of these molecules are known to be important in regulating appetite and uh, body weight. And what Dr. Yostin is going to be asking is, are these really relevant in PWS? Um, so uh, looking specifically at this protein called CART, um, which is known to regulate appetite and body weight, um, and see how the CART and its receptor are, are working in PWS cells. So the goal is to, um, to evaluate uh, the role of CART in appetite regulation, and this will use a, a rat model of PWS. So again, it's one of those preclinical studies, just kind of testing if this is a new therapeutic avenue that we should be going down. So we're excited about the study because this intro, the, you know, this particular circuit, uh, feeding circuit, hasn't really been studied in PWS before, and it's a potential target for therapeutics. Um, this is a young, enthusiastic investigator. She has some experience in PWS, but this would really draw her into the field. And um, the study uses the rat model of PWS. Um, so in addition to learning about this circuit, it will help us learn more about the utility of, of this, this model for understanding drug development in PWS. And the long-term goal is to uh, the identification of a feeding circuit that may have relevance to PWS and serve as a possible therapeutic target. Another study, uh, this is a rat uh, heavy uh, set of, of uh, little grants here, is uh, coming from Baylor College of Medicine uh, from the Samaco lab. Um, and they are experts in looking at different rodent models and uh, characterizing them and sort of establishing how they should be used in drug development, um, as well as understanding what the animals can tell us about uh, PWS. So um, Dr. Samaco has two different rat models. Uh, one is a SNRPN model that was actually developed by another investigator, uh, Dr. Art Baudet, as well as the MAGIL2 uh, rat that was developed by FPWR. And they'll be looking at both of these rat models and comparing the behavioral phenotypes and the protein profiles um, of these two different rat models. So rats are um, important and good um, because they provide a different model compared to mice, for example. Rats have much more social interaction, so they're, they're more useful for looking at behavioral phenotypes. There's a lot of uh, rat models of autism, for example, so we can maybe understand how social interactions in PWS are the same and differ from autism. Um, this is a group that has been studying the MAGIL2 rat and uh, now we'll be looking at the SNRP-N rat and so they have many things in place to do this efficiently. And um, they're also extremely collaborative. They've got a lot of other studies in other neurodevelopmental disorders. So understanding how the PWS rats are the same and different from, for example, Rett syndrome rats, uh, you know, really can provide some insights. So long term, these are going to provide a great tool for preclinical studies and also I enable the identification of potential therapeutic uh, interventions and also the differences in uh, sort of the protein composition in PWS compared to typical brains. 
um, getting into the weeds of uh, molecular biology um, is uh, Dr. Lehman, who's going to look at the epitranscriptomic signatures of a particular type of neuron, what's, what's commonly known as kind of the hunger neurons, these AGRP neurons. So um, we know that hyperphagia is thought to uh, stem from a problem, a dysregulation of the neurons that balance the hunger and satiety signals. And um, Dr. Lehman is uh, proposing that the, there are disruptions in the chemical code of the RNA in those molecules, in, in those neurons. So she's gonna use uh, human hypothalamic uh, hunger neurons from typical individuals and um, some stem cells, again, that were developed with FPWR funding that have, have removed some of the important genes like SNORD116. And she's gonna look at the profile of RNA in the typical compared to the PWS. So this is an interesting study test because it's going to provide a more comprehensive understanding of what SNORD116 is doing. We know SNORD116 is really important in PWS because whenever it's lost, we get the characteristics of PWS, but we don't fully understand still what it's doing. And understanding that might help us, again, develop, have new therapeutic targets. So this is a research that will support that goal. Um, this group, this, this lab is new to PWS research, but they have a lot of experience in understanding stem cells and how um, we can use stem cells to understand the basis of obesity. So again, we're drawing in a new body of knowledge about um, you know, the function of stem cells in obesity. Um, so the long-term goal is to establish new cellular models of PWS for insights on how this particular modification of RNA might be altered in PWS. Um, and finally, uh, a grant uh, that we've provided to uh, Dr. Uh, Zeman Meyer, who is at the University of Basel, and he is going to be looking at the pancreas, which is a uh, you know, it's obviously, it's not your brain, it's a peripheral tissue that's important in regulating metabolism. Um, and, you know, specifically at pancreatic beta cells. So we do think very much about the hypothalamus and how important that is in PWS, but there's also evidence that the pancreas, which also expresses, um, you know, some of these PWS genes might also be regulating some of the metabolism and the metabolic disturbances that we see in PWS. Um, and the pancreas is important for secreting a lot of the hormones that regulate that appetite, uh, satiety, and general metabolic health. Um, so this study will look at the role of those PWS genes in pancreatic beta cells. It's, it's kind of a, a first step in seeing how we can uh, potentially modify the pancreas or the function of the pancreas to help normalize metabolism in PWS. But the first thing you have to do is you have to really understand how the PWS genes are expressed in the pancreas and what their function is. And that's what um, you know, this study is really focused on. So this is a novel approach, you know, looking at peripheral organs rather than the brain and how the loss of PWS genes in those organs might be altering the metabolism. Um, it is a young investigator who's new to PWS, um, but he has expertise in, uh, sorry, that's my daughter. <laughs> um, he's a young investigator who's new to PWS, but he has expertise in uh, endocrine and uh, uh, endocrine function. And the long-term goal is to lead to a new understanding of the role of the pancreas in PWS and metabolic disturbances uh, and possible approaches to target pancreatic function. School is out now, isn't that great? <laughs> Okay, so to wrap up, um, what to expect as we continue into 2021. So we are starting to see, you know, many of the projects that were underway really um, slowed down a bit with the, the COVID. So people had to be out of the lab. Um, they, hey there, they had to be out of the lab. Um, and when they went back in the lab, there couldn't be too many people at a time. So, so things slowed down, but we're starting to see them pick back up. 
Um, we expect to see the start or the ramp up of many clinical trials. As we mentioned, Harmony's uh, patolescent trial is ongoing. And if you're interested, um, there's 10 recruitment sites open for that. There will be additional studies that we expect to open this year. So please keep an eye on that and please consider whether you might wanna participate. Again, many of the companies have modified the protocols now to do more of the data collection remotely, so it should be less of a burden to participate. We are really going to continue to push the advocacy with the FDA, help the FDA understand the needs of the community, um, you know, the risks that we're willing to take, um, you, you know, just really uh, help them understand PWS and the needs that we have. Um, we, we expect that, that uh, many new insights into the biology of PWS and the molecular mechanisms. Uh, the stem cell studies are really starting to yield some fruit and we're excited about that. Um, we are also working with the PWS, many PWS clinicians um, in a collaborative setting um, and they are working very hard to try to standardize across clinical sites so they can start uh, gathering data that is shared among the sites and ask questions that individually they can't ask on their own and they're just in their own site. So FPWR is supporting that and uh, the development of that group and trying to um, facilitate all of their collaboration because we know the more collaboration we have, the faster we're going to get answers. Um, I think we'll see a lot of publications detailing some of the global PWS registry findings. Thank you to everyone who's been participating in the registry. And uh, again, I'll ask you if you have not updated your surveys recently, if you can set, it, set aside a little bit of time and update that, that is a huge help to understanding PWS overall, understanding how best to deliver care, and also to provide support for these new drugs that are in development. Um, and we'll continue to work with the PWS Clinical Trials Consortium to set the stage for drug development and support all of the new therapies that are moving forward. Again, you know, our goal working with PWSA, with IPSO, with, you know, everyone in the community is to be supportive of uh, these new drugs so that we can know for sure if they're safe and effective in our population. Um, so, Finally, thank you to all of our supporters and fundraisers. I know it's been a very challenging year and um, uh, for all of us, we really appreciate everyone who's been able to support FPWR. We look forward to getting back to having in-person meetings and in-person uh, events and uh, you know, really appreciate all that uh, you have done to support the organization and the PWS community as we uh, move forward. So Susan, Yes. That's all I have. That's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Teresa, for going through these grants with us. I can say without having a science background, these grants can be overwhelming, and it really helps to have someone like yourself explaining them to us so that we can have a better understanding, not just of the grant itself, but of the importance of why they need to be funded. So with that, um, we are going to open this up to Q&A. Just as a reminder, you're welcome to submit your questions. There is a Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and you can send us any questions that you might have. We're happy to answer them. Um, we're going to jump right into a few. All right, um, go ahead. I see one on the NIH. Does the NIH have a budget for research projects in the PWS area? So they don't, the NIH doesn't have a specific set aside, um, but they, they do fund PWS research. And one of the things that is really important for us to use are somewhat limited funds is to uh, choose projects that if they get, you know, if, if, if the investigators, you know, get data that is supportive of their hypothesis, they can then go to NIH and get funding. And that's when I say that, you know, we've invested 15 million, but there's been more than 25 million additional dollars invested. That is in large part the NIH. So for example, Stormy Chamberlain and Gordon Carmichael had a grant um, and I think, you know, we supported it for $100,000. 
they use that information to build a larger study that, that then uh, is supported by the NIH for, you know, something like four years, $250,000 a year. So, you know, it's turning our investments of $100,000 into a million dollars of NIH funding to really go deeper. The NIH is very competitive. So only about, you know, 10 to 15% of grants get funded. And there are 7,000 rare disorders and the NIH, you know, will fund any of them. Um, so giving our investigators the uh, sort of that, that leg up to get their initial preliminary data puts them in a much more competitive position so that they can be uh, successful in getting funding from the NIH. Fantastic. The, um, the next question that I see coming in, actually, I've, I've gotten this question by a number of people even outside of the webinar, is in regards to the genome project and the age requirement. So currently you have to be age 10 or up to enroll in or to participate in that study. What was the um, thought process behind setting that age for 10? Right. So as I said, this is like we're piloting it now. Right. So we're just getting started our, our long term goal. We'd like to expand this study and, you know, expand the age and, and expand the number of people who can be in it. We're just kind of getting started and, uh, you know, um, getting the best information we can and kind of working through uh, the logistics of it. It's, it's a little complicated. So um, and we chose 10 and up because we want to look at things like mental health problems. Are there gene variants that put people at risk for more mental health problems? Um, you know, some of the later complications that we see. Uh, severity of hyperphagia, for example. And those features are going to be most easily characterized in older individuals. So we're starting kind of with the lower hanging fruit to, um, you know, learn which variants might be most important. And then our goal, again, over a number of years, I would imagine, is to expand the study and be more inclusive. But to get that first bit of data and, and sort of understand things the most clearly, uh, we feel like the older individuals are going to have more information that we can use to see which variants are uh, important variants to be looking at. And in the future, will people under the age of 10 be able to participate? That is our goal. It's an expensive project. And what we'd like to do is get outside funding for it. So we'd like to do the same thing that we ask our investigators to do is to get some information and then get outside funding potentially from the NIH um, to, su to support it. So again, that's why we're trying to get the most, the strongest preliminary data that we can to show the utility so that we can um, you know, get additional funding. So, you know, the NIH, you know, their typical budgets are $250,000, $300,000 a year for, you know, uh, several years. And that's, that's, that's a lot of money for, for our organization. So we'd like to get uh, outside funding for that. Mm -hmm. Um, can we get more details on the adult spine study? Um, first, how will um, adults that are going to be enrolled in the study be identified? Will this be, will people be asked to participate? Um, so this is going to go through a network of clinicians. Again, I mentioned this uh, clinical uh, uh, um, uh, initiative that we have. Um, so it there's a network of clinicians at, that have kind of signed on to participate with Dr. Van Boss. And um, so through them, uh, so, so you won't have to go see Dr. Van Boss necessarily. If you're uh, going to a clinician who is uh, participating in this project, you may get asked at your site if you would like to participate. So it is going through a number of PWS clinicians. That's great. And then once the study is completed, how will those results be made available to surgeons who might be performing scoliosis surgery? Right. So I think it would probably be through publications. I mean, that, you know, that's what, you know, clinicians do is look at what's out in the literature. So I would expect that it would be published and then, um, you know, would uh, other surgeons can look can look at it as well. It'll be presented at meetings. You know, I'm sure there's an orthopedics meeting. It would probably, I would imagine that Dr. Van Boss would present it there, and then you know, it, it, the word would be spread. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the grants program, how are specific projects selected? What's the process? 
Um, well, we have both a, um, a, a peer review process where scientists evaluate um, the grants. Um, so typically we recruit at least two scientific reviewers, one of whom is typically very familiar with PWS, and then one who is maybe sort of a subject matter expert. So if it's stem cells, maybe they work in stem cells, but not necessarily PWS stem cells. Um, and we ask them to evaluate the scientific merit of the project. Uh, and then we also have advocate reviewers, uh, and those are people in the community who self-identify, and you can, uh, you know, email me or uh, Jessica Vahanovich or Caroline Granadias, and uh, let us know that you're interested in that. And the role of the advocate is to judge whether a project is important to all of us, right? So there's some scientifically sound projects that maybe are you know, not really relevant to what we think would be, you know, important for our kids. And so those aren't projects that we're going to fund. Um, so we try to combine the scientific review with the advocate review and select those projects that are both important to the community and um, scientifically sound. Mm -hmm. So how do you connect the dots from these projects to potential treatments? For those of us who don't understand the science behind or the background, how do we, how do we know that these are going to move us forward? Well, I mean, I guess I would say we, we don't know <laughs> for sure. And that's the point of a grant program is that you, you know, you plant a lot of seeds um, and then, um, you know, have things in place. Oops. I was trying to go backwards, but obviously I screwed that up. <laughs> um, but I did show that list of, uh, and I, I'll just say it. I, I did show that list of uh, therapies that have been tried, right? So, so some of them have been tried in the mouse and some of them didn't work out, right? But that's important to know. We don't want to try everything in humans because, you know, as we all know, it's, you know, A, there's risk there and B, it's just very hard and expensive to do. So, um, you know, looking at different um, uh, uh, drugs, testing them in mouse models, maybe doing small uh, uh, studies in humans is the way to go. So uh, again, there's, we have supported many compounds that are being tested in humans and many more that have been tested in mice and are making that transition into humans. So I think it would, we probably, Susan, you and I should get together and draw some pathways just to show people the, the you know, those things that have made it. But I do think it's important that, you know, we've tested some things and found that, you know, it's not relevant to PWS. And that's important too. You want to be crossing things off the list as well as adding things to the list. Right. Ultimately, we know not everything is going to work, but we have to try things. You know, I like to say, leave no stone unturned, right? This yeah. Our mission is so vitally important that we don't want to miss anything. So it's important to be able to cross them off. We did have a follow-up question um, in regards to some of the funding. Are there grant sources in the private sector that resources that researchers can tap into? Um, yes, for sure. Um, uh, well, we're I guess we're private, right? So foundations like ours, as well as um, you know, there are other. Um, larger private foundations that support, for example, obesity research or more general research that uh, individuals, researchers can apply for. I mean, if you're a researcher, that's kind of your job is that you know the agencies that, um, you know, you, you can apply for funding to. There are other government agencies as well. Uh, PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, uh, offers a lot of grant funding for what they call comparative effectiveness research. So comparing two existing treatments and seeing which one works better. Um, and, you know, there are researchers in the PWS field who have applied to the, for those grants and are applying for those grants. So there are lots of sources. The NIH is just the largest source of biomedical research funding in, in, in the country, um, but there are other private sources. Um, some researchers uh, collaborate with drug companies and, you know, have drug companies support their work. work. I mean, that's happened in the PWS space as well, where the drug companies have paired with a PWS researcher to ask a specific question um, in cell models or in animal models prior to going into uh, clinical studies. Mm -hmm. um, 
For those of us who are new to the community, are there previously funded projects currently in progress that you're particularly excited about? You know, there's so much going on. Um, I mean, I think the work in the stem cells and I, I mean, so I'm, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm a molecular geneticist, right? So I like the basic biology. I like to, un, I like to know how is PWS different so that we can design rational approaches um, to treating PWS. And so there are many studies ongoing now that we've previously given funding to trying to answer that question. So I'm excited about that. I mean, I also am intrigued by the um, genetic therapies. So these studies, and we have many, again, in progress. And those are the studies that are kind of at the point where they're just working in the lab right now. So six months or a year from now, I think, you know, those studies will have read out. But understanding whether we can do gene activation in PWS, A, whether we can do it, uh, and then B, whether it would have a, 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 an important effect, like a therapeutic effect, whether, you know, on, on like, would it help my son who's 27, or would you have to do it on a baby, or would you have to do it, you know, prenatally? So just understanding the possibilities in genetic therapies, I think, is something that um, we're making good progress towards. I don't think it'll be as you know simple and fast, but we're you know we have people now working on that, and I think that's going to be a very important conversation for us as a field to 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 think about. I mean that that's something for long term, and then in the short term, just looking at some of these therapies that we have, we are so close to having new approved therapies in PWS, and I think if we can um, you know get some therapies sort of over the finish line, it will really open up. Uh, a lot of other investments, um, you know, and, and it is the experience that, you know, if you get one drug in place, it, it brings new innovations to a field and it helps develop new drugs. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we're working really hard uh, to do what we can as a patient community and a patient group uh, to help move that along. You mentioned earlier that um, parents in our community really have a very important job, which is to um, participate in trials when when they can. Ultimately, no one no one else can do that for us, right? Our community has to step up and, and participate in trials in order for us to get new treatments approved. Um, if, if if a person is registered in the PWS registry. If you are eligible for a study, an email will go out to you, you know, notifying you of that. But Teresa, how can you make sure that you have signed up for that email? Well, if you're in the registry, you, you know, the registry is set up to really protect your privacy. And when you, if, if you're in the registry and you set up an account at the very beginning, it asked whether we could contact you or not. If you checked that we can't contact you, we cannot send you emails. Um, so, and, and some people just do that automatically, like, I don't want emails. Um, so I would encourage you if you are in the registry um, and you can check that status and your contact information and, and um, uncheck that box. We don't send out a lot of we don't we, we send no fundraising information and we don't send out a lot of emails through the registry we try to keep it just to registry business um, so if you're willing and and make sure that that is unchecked um, and and then we can send you emails and the way we do it through the registry is you know if it if the inclusion criteria is age 12 and up, we don't send that email to, you know, five-year-olds. So we do try to, you know, really tailor it to people who would be eligible. So I know we get a million thousand emails every day. And so sometimes they get buried in your emails, but um, if you have checked that we can contact you, we should be able to send you those emails. Mm -hmm. and, and to second that, you know, if you see, Every once in a while, if you check your trash, if you find an email into your trash from the registry, can you please move, move it back into your inbox, protect those emails? Because again, the, the, the few emails that we do send you through the registry um, are very important. So um, we want you to make sure that they're getting into your inbox so that you can open them. Um, and the clinical trial alert, I mean, 
uh, you know, that's another way. If you go to the clinical trial page and, and uh, put your name in there, you'll just get notifications like updates on, and that goes out more often. It's still not tons, uh, but it goes out, you know, we usually just send one or maybe two emails through the registry. Um, but the clinical trial alert goes out more often. And then, um, you know, if there's new sites, that's where you would learn like, oh, there's a new site and it's near me. So, um, you know, I think that's an important mailing list to be on if you're interested in clinical trials. I've been adding links to the chat as we've been going along today. So um, if you want to visit the clinical trials directory, it is linked in the chat as well as several other resources that have been mentioned in Teresa's presentation. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. This is a great one. Um, the, the, the question is, is asking about Canadians, but really I think that brings up the larger point is, can an international audience participate in research? Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. So, um, you know, some clinical trials, uh, you know, it depends on the clinical trial. If it's a US clinical trial, if Canadians can come in. So you'd have to find that information out directly from the sponsoring company. Um, but there are clinical trials that are in Canada and there are clinical trials that will be in Canada. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's new clinical trials opening. I know some of those uh, new companies are looking at Canadian sites. Um, so, you know, on the clinical trial side, yes. Um, and then even if not clinical trials, there are many other ways you can participate in research. Again, information that you give to the global PWS registry is just critical for supporting not only our understanding of PWS, but also supporting clinical research and drug development. And then there are all these, um, you know, remote uh, interventions that may be of interest to you. For example, Again, uh, Anastasia Dimitropoulos at Case Western is doing a study on six to nine year olds and uh, the pretend study, which helps uh, kids develop uh, social interaction and play skills. Um, Stuart Einfeld and Lauren Rice at, in Australia are doing a study on mindfulness. So teaching a person with PWS through their parents mindfulness to reduce uh, aggression, and they are doing that around the world. So I know that there's been people in the US who have participated in that study. So, you know, they are they are country agnostic. And now that we have Zoom, there's just more opportunities for those kinds of remote studies uh, to be done anywhere in the world. So again, please, if you're outside of the US, um, you know, please do pay attention and, you know, sign up for the alerts and, uh, you know, many of many opportunities exist for, uh, you know, everyone across the globe. Fantastic, Teresa. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. A recording of this webinar will be made available sometime next week. And if you'd like to stay up to date on the latest in PWS research, please visit our website at fpwr.org. You can sign up for our newsletter and our blog. Links to both of those have been included in the chat. So once again, have a great, wonderful um, day and a, and a long weekend, and we'll see you soon.